Well, it looks like it's nine o'clock. Looks like maybe everybody's here, who knows? Let me just make sure I've got everything it's supposed to be, how it is supposed to be. We'll have to call that good enough. Well, good morning. The very first thing I have to say is I just realized as I was getting set to go here is that I did not wear my work shirt today. I wore my, well, I wore my work shirt, which is like the shirt that I use to make breakfast and clean stuff up. And it's not the shirt that I wear to my job at school, so I feel a little silly about that, but it's a, it's a shirt that I really love because it's the Wilderness Medical Associates shirt, and I worked hard to get my Wilderness First Responder training um, many years ago, and I've gotten recertified, recertified every year, and so it's a good shirt. I like the back of it, too. Basically, any challenge anywhere, is that what it says? I've forgotten. Well, good morning. Good morning, first grade, and I will sing that to you as well. Good morning, first grade, are you here? Yes, Mr. Coulter, we are here. Well, it's time for the morning verse, and again, it's a great way to start the day to find some way of marking the new day and appreciating it out loud. Did you know that long, long ago in ancient times, People thought that the, the new sun, a new sun was born every day and lived its life across the sky and then was no more. And each day a new sun came up, a brand new one. And they thought, Let's, we need to honor this new sun, this new baby that's come along. We have to honor it by making this a great day. And that's one of the things that they, that they felt and did. And so I will... beautiful flowers that Auntie Jackie brought yesterday. And we will see her again soon. Here we go. The sun with loving light makes bright for me each day. The soul with spirit power, oh, the heart with sacred power gives strength unto my limbs. In sunlight shining clear, I am reverent. The strength of humankind has so graciously been planted in my soul that I, with all my might, may love to work and learn. Toward us come light and strength. From us rise love and thanks. Well, today is the Friday the 28th. Finally getting my days straightened out, hopefully. I've always depended on student, some student or other to tell me what day it is. They are so good at keeping track of it, some of them, or they would check their little watch or something, but now I have to do it all on my own. So today is Friday, August 28th, so I'm going to write that in cursive. D-A-Y spells day, Friday, August. August 28th, 28th with a little at the end, 28th with a little th, 28th at the end. And the year is still, of course, 2020. In other words, 2020. Welcome to this day. I welcome myself. I welcome you to this day. And we will go right into head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Ready? Ending up. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. It's funny, to do it, you have to think ahead a tiny bit. Like while you're saying the first word, you have to think of the next word. 
Do it faster, here we go. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Especially the eyes, ears, mouth, nose part. Here we go. Slower. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. In Hawaiian. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. E malama kokino. Two more times. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. E malama kokino. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. Po o po o hivi kuli va vai. E malama kokino. Malama kokino means take care of your body. Respect and take care of your body. Um, I am not an expert in Hawaiian, so if I ever say anything that you uh, think is incorrect, then definitely message me. All right, now we're going to Crooked Man. Here we go, there. Let's get the rhythm first. Trying to go too fast this time. There was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a very crooked house. There was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked side. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a very crooked house. There was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a very crooked house. And now I want to do a little, a little math story for you. See if you can keep track. I'll use my fingers and you can too. There were this many cats. Didn't have a chance to count them, but I bet you know how many fingers you have on one hand, don't you? And this many more came to see them. There were this many cats, this many cats, right? And then this many more. Do you see that well enough? This many more came to see them. How many were there all together at the end? Well, there were this many, and then this many more came to see them. I know this is five. I can count to make sure. One, two, three, four, five. And I can count these other three. One, two, three. So five and three. Let's try that again. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five and three is eight cats. Eight cats, that's a lot of cats. I hope they get along well together. <laughs> Usually they don't get along that well together, but they figure it out sometimes. Eight cats, that's a lot of cats. I have two cats at my house. I wonder if you have any pets at your house, any cats or anything else. I'm sure you probably, many of you do have cat or dog or many other kinds of things that people have as pets. And there's farm animals too, of course. Those are kind of pets in a way. Um, the next thing I want to do is uh, count to 100 and then we will have Auntie Jackie join us. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Help me out with your fingers and your voice. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 
40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 9, 100. Yay, we did it again. Next week, we're going to make it a little more complicated, little by little. Uh, we're going to start by, well, I'll leave that for next week. Um, Auntie Jackie, are you here? Yeah. Oh, good. Please come in. I will don my mask, which means to put it on. Oh, my. Wait until you see what Auntie Jackie has brought. I'll turn the camera. I don't even see her behind there. It looks like a big walking leaf. My goodness. That is a quite a large leaf. I've not, I don't think I've ever seen a leaf quite that big. Hi, guys. I'll turn. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Thanks for having me. Hi, good morning, first graders. Good morning, Auntie oh, Jackie. Good morning. Lessons on your arrival, yes. Hi, everybody. So today, when I went up to the garden, I thought, you know what, I want to use my senses of sight. I wanted to, um, I wanted to find the biggest thing and the littlest thing. So when I went in the garden, I started to think about bringing you with me. So I want you to close your eyes right now. Take a deep breath. We're at the gate. We just finished the chant. A malama ku aina. A malama la'au. So we're gonna open the gate and come on in the garden. And you guys get to go wherever you want. So I'm walking in the garden and I'm walking up the hill, up the hill, up the hill, and I'm looking around for the biggest thing I can see. And what do you know? The biggest thing I can see is the ocean. Picture that ocean, it's so big. It's far away, but it's still very big. And I look and see on the ocean some tiny, tiny, That is what I can picture in my imagination right now again. You can open your eyes, take a big breath. But guess what? I couldn't bring the ocean with you to carry, but I could bring it to you for your imagination. But what I can bring to you is the biggest leaf that I could find in the garden. I'm imagining some of you could guess what this is. You remember seeing it way up high, attached to its trunk. and. After it's being a leaf for so long, it starts to produce its fruit, which everybody knows and loves as a ba -ba -ba banana. This is a banana leaf, you guys. It's the biggest thing I could carry down here without dropping it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's taller than you and, and taller than me. And we can stay six feet apart. <laughs> we can stay six feet apart. In fact, I think that's probably about eight or ten feet, is it? If we Close didn't feet. have a blackboard, this could be our blackboard. That's right. Cool. And speaking of boats, it almost looks like a, it has a keel on the bottom and everything. It could be a, a sort of a boat, although I probably wouldn't float with anybody on it. But. And some people will cut a piece of this banana like this. And they, this is their plate. This is used all over the world where they have bananas. This becomes the plate. Then we don't have to wash it. Then we don't have to recycle it. We could just put it in the compost bin for its own recycle. And it already looks very clean, even. I know. The rain. So if I pick the biggest thing, the big banana, and then I wanted to go all the way down to the next littlest thing, so it's the opposite of big, then I wanted to show you this. The littlest thing I could find and carry and not lose was this tiny little. You see that? That's a small flower. This flower is going to make a seed that's even tinier than the flower. 
So I brought down the littlest thing I could find after I found you the biggest thing. And then I thought, is there anything in between that I would like to share? And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to bring a pretty thing. So this is a flower I brought from the garden. I think that bringing flowers is a very nice thing. My dad taught me that. He would always bring me a flower. And now I bring him flowers. And he would bring anybody he liked a flower. Everybody he cared about. He would give the garbage men a, a flower. And so you're bringing us flowers. And we all get to see them. There's so many kinds of flowers. Think about how you would describe this flower. You could say it out loud to your mama. You could say it to your stuffed animal buddy. And I'm going to um, think of something with Mr. Uh, Coulter right now. You think of something about this flower. I'll think something and then we think about something too, right? Okay. To me, it, um, it reminds me of a fountain. Because oh. things coming off the sides and then the smaller ones up the top just kind of barely spraying off. It looks like a fountain. But it also has this twisty quality, which of course water wouldn't have if it was pushing up. When I see that flower, what are my thoughts were juicy and red. Mm. So you can add this to your flower bouquet if you like, Mr. Coulter? Yes, please. It's also very strong, and the backs feel uh, this odd combination of sort of fuzzy and yet smooth. It feels like they must have such, oh. such tiny little hairs that they're just, it almost feels, it feels a little bit just soft, very soft and fuzzy. I, I didn't even cool. notice that. I was busy moving around. See, when we slow down, we can really notice. And that's the nice thing about having a nature table where if you bring it back to your house or your lanai, you can spend more time with something um, and, and get to know it a little better. So I invite you guys to look around you and see what is the biggest thing that you see in the room or the biggest thing you see in the sky? And what is the littlest thing? Thank you very much for your time, and I, I wait for the day we get to be in the garden together. Thank you very much, Auntie Jackie. Oh, it's so nice to have you here. Would you like to leave the banana leaf for a little while? Sure, yeah, that's fine. All right. Maybe you can use it for your lunch plate. <laughs> I will do that. Mm -hmm. Bye, bye. I, I will have to move it so that I can get to the board, I think. But ah. look at that. It is definitely taller than me. I'll pick it up like that. Mm -hmm. I only come up to here on it, and there's all that. Top, so. All right. Thank you. That is such a nice treat to have her coming in. So we had the star money story, and we had the form drawing, and I hope that you can see that I have been working on my black chalk. You could use your black stick, uh, block crayon to kind of just lightly go over the blue sky. I also put my black stick crayon or stick chalk in my case, over the brown uh, tree branches. And um, I did a few more things, I think, but I don't quite remember. Worked on the little girl a little bit more and tried to make her the right size and shape. And so, and then we did the form drawing and we're gonna continue on form drawing um, tomorrow as well, or Friday, uh, Monday rather. Um, to Right now, though, I want to draw your attention to something you can't quite see on there, which is up on the corner. I put our capital A and our lowercase a. I think I mentioned that lowercase a is something I would usually teach later in the year. But because we started late, and because some people uh, would like that extra challenge of learning how to draw the lowercase a from starting in this corner and going around, kind of like going backwards, going the back that way and then ending up on this side and uppercase we always start from the top and go down of course i think i will um just review with you how to draw that so again we do the uppercase a like so from the top down again kind of moving backwards at first but it's backwards is that way and moving forward that way, like all the numbers and words start over here and they go that way. So we're, when we form our letters, we do it the same way. And we always start at the top. That's the tricky part for kids sometimes. And then we're gonna go again from this side to that side. And we make our uppercase A. With the lowercase A, it's about half the size. So I'm gonna draw a dotted line for myself there. 
I'm going to dot a line for myself there to show me where I need to be. I'm going to start here. I'm going to move backwards at first, this way. I'm going to go this way, this way, and then time it so I get back up to the top, and then my little tail goes on there. So obviously those arrows are just to show you the way. I put them in a different color so it's not doesn't look weird. And all the way up. Up, and then back down. Okay, so you can practice those. And as we mentioned, A makes a lot of different sounds. It turns out A is one of the more complicated ones, but if you can remember just that it makes A and A, as in apple, then that's enough for now. But it does sneak in and kind of copy some other of the other letter sounds that, uh, but you just, you just figure it out as you go, as, as you learn to read. Um, and I want to uh, give you an example of some words that have the A sound in it. And at the same time, we're going to do some rhyming. So we have uh, the word, can you think of a word? I think I mentioned one a little bit earlier, a word that has A sound in it. And I said D-A-Y spells day. So day is the word I was thinking of. I wonder if you can think of something that rhymes with day. Something that, and, and I thought of several, and so maybe you're thinking of the same ones. There's day, of course, and then there's, um, there's, there's play. I like to play with my friends. Or there's stay. I had to stay at home today. Oh, today. Today also rhymes with day. It has the same exact part of it at the end, to day. And then there's hooray, which is always a, a fun one to say when you're happy. And there's bay, which is a, when the ocean is, a little part of the ocean is surrounded by parts of the land. And we have many bays here in Hawaii, of course. Um, and then there's May, like Mother May I, and there's the month of May. And then there's way. I know the way to learn best, or I know the way to cook uh, scrambled eggs, or I know the way from my house to the park. Um, and then I guess that's all the ones I thought of for now. So there's all those. Um, and maybe you'll think of more. And there's many other words that have the A sound in it, but maybe doesn't rhyme with day, play, stay. We can cover those another time. Um, I want to do one more thing, which is to um, write the word uh, star money. Now, I know many of us have not learned all these letters yet, but you can still copy them. So I'm going to turn to, I'm going to turn to my drawing here. I'm going to move this so that I can write at the top of it. I'm going to choose a color that will show up well, which probably in my case will be white. And you could use a, a dark blue stick crayon, or you could use a black stick crayon. So if you don't have those things handy, then just remember for next time to have your main lesson book and your practice book and some scratch paper and um, your crayons and anything else that you might need, your pencil. So I'm going to write star money. Now, I'm, can, I can fit the word star here because I'm going to be careful not to make them too big. If your word star gets big, then you can write the word money under it. In fact, I think that's what I'm going to do, just in case that's the way most people will end up doing it. S T There's our A in this case, making the sound ah, star, and ah is one of those times when A is really making a sound that should be an O in most cases, but star is spelled star, S-T-A-R, star, an er at the end, an R at the end, star, and I'm going to write the word money right here. Uh, mm, M O N, mm, money. If I'm 
getting ahead of you, don't worry. You can always go back and look at it and fill it in later. And then EY at the end. E and I don't know if you're going to be able to see that behind itself. There we go. Star Money. That's the name of that story. And once we get a little bit, once we have all of our letters able to write, then we can write many more things. And you will be able to sound things out and write them yourself. So I'm trying to see my notes here if I've forgotten to do anything yet today. And I'm seeing that I've covered everything that I was going to do, except tell you another story. So, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get my stool so I can sit down and sit a little closer. And I'm going to tell you another story. There were once three sons of a king. And the two older ones left the, the castle to go and seek their fortune and explore the world. But unfortunately, they fell into a wild and rapscallionish sort of manner of living and ended up never coming back. Well, the youngest one was thought of as not as smart as the others, but he convinced his father, the king, to let him go out and uh, seek his fortune and also seek his brothers. So he went out into the world and sought his brothers and they made fun of him because they called him Simpleton. In fact, his name was Dumbling, and, or that's what they called him anyway because they thought he wasn't very smart. But he and his brothers stayed together and explored the world together for a while. And once, they, as they were exploring around, they came upon uh, a castle. And this castle was far away from their home castle. They'd never seen it before. And they, just, as they walked up, it was very strange because it was so quiet. It looked like a well-kept castle. It didn't look like no one had been there for many years or anything like that. But as they walked in, they saw the strangest thing. They saw there were some horses outside the castle and they looked so lifelike, but they were made of stone. And the brothers walked inside, they searched all through the castle and not a person could they find, mm -hmm. only statues of people. And finally they came to a door that was locked with three locks was a keyhole and they put their eye up to the keyhole to see what they could see and inside they saw a most amazing thing. They saw a table set with the most sumptuous of feasts. It was a beautiful huge feast as if for many people and there sat a very strange and man. He looked rather scary but the boys tried the locks couldn't open them. They knocked one time, no one answered. They knocked again a little harder, and still the old man did not get up and come to the door. Well, the third time they knocked, the old man got, did get up and came to the door and unlocked one, two, three locks and let the boys in. Without a word, he gestured to the table inviting them to the feast. They were very hungry and the food looked very good and so they sat and they ate. And then the old man, when they were done, brought them up and showed each one a room to sleep in. A beautiful room with a well-made bed, very comfortable as a castle would have. Well, in the night, the old man came to the eldest brother, woke him up, told him that you could to go out. Oh, I forgot the first part of the story. To go back, rewind. As they were traveling around, those three brothers, as they were traveling around, the older boys being ill-behaved, they saw an anthill and they thought, let's break this anthill apart and watch all the ants scurry around carrying their eggs hither and thither and just for fun. And the younger brother said, oh no, I will not let you do that. You will not disturb those ants, the poor things. They're just trying to live, make their living and go about their lives. Do not bother them. And so he convinced his brothers to go on. 
Next, later on, they passed a lake, and on the lake were many ducks, many, many ducks. And the two brothers wanted to, even though they weren't that hungry at the time, the two brothers wanted to kill two of them and roast them. And the younger brother said, no, no, leave the poor ducks in peace. There's plenty of food elsewhere that we can get. And he convinced his brothers not to kill the ducks. And lastly, there was some, uh, a beehive in a, in a tree. And the two brothers wanted to build a fire at the bottom of the tree and smoke the bees out and thus collect the honey. But again, the younger brother said, no, don't bother the poor bees. That's their winter stores of honey, Bill. Don't take their honey away. Then they got to the house, and then they ate the feast, and then they went to their rooms and slept. And the brother, the biggest, the older brother was told by the old man, the princess who lived in this castle is under a deep sleep. There were three princesses, in fact, and they're all three in an enchanted sleep. And you have to go out and get the pearls from the necklace, which are out in the bog, in the moss, in the grassy area outside. And if you don't get them all, all thousand pearls, then by morning you'll be turned to stone. Well, he could only find a hundred, and that's all he could find. The second brother was awoken, and he was told there is a key to the princess's bedroom, and it's at the bottom of the lake. And if you don't get it out of the mud at the bottom of the lake, by morning, you'll be turned to stone. And the poor boy went out swimming around, holding his breath, going, looking down there, but never could he find a key. And then the youngest brother was awoken, and he was told that he had to discover, after finding the pearls and after finding the key, he had to do the third task, which is to discover which of the three girls is the youngest, even though they all look alike. They all look exactly alike. And the only clue you have is before they went to sleep, one of them had a little bit of sugar, one of them had a little bit of syrup, and one of them had a little bit of honey. So the youngest son went out into the grass and starts looking around for pearls and can't find hardly any. And he sits down on a rock and begins to cry. Who should come along but the queen of the ants and the queen of the ants said what is wrong and he said I'm looking for all these pearls that are lost in the grass 1,000 pearls and the ants said never fear me and all of my nest will go and find all the pearls and so she and all of her ants came out and bravely found all thousand pearls and gave them to the boy next he went to the lake and saw that there was no way for him to find the key in the bottom of the muddy lake, but sure enough, who was there but some ducks, and they were the ducks that he had rescued earlier. And the, the ducks said, never fear, we will find it. And the ducks swam all around and dove down under as ducks do, and they collected, found the key, and gave it to the boy. Then the boy took the key and opened the door to the princess's room, and he saw that there was no way he could figure out which of the princesses was the youngest one who had eaten the honey, how would he have to possibly know that? But the queen bee came in who he had helped and the queen bee said, never fear, I will land on each of the girl's lips and I can tell honey from sugar and honey from syrup. And sure enough, she did and he did. And of course, you can guess the rest. He probably married the princess and the brothers probably married the older princesses and they all lived peacefully and happily till the end of their days. So it is, and so it was, and so it shall be. Thank you for listening to the story, and I know some of you are ready to move on and ready to go for the day, and that's fine. I will see you next week. However, um, if you are in the mood for um, another story, then I'm gonna read aloud the first chapter of this book that I have here. You can just listen. 
So this chapter is called The Adventures of Jane, the Cat Who Was a Dog. That's a silly title, isn't it? The Adventures of Jane, the Cat Who Was a Dog. And these are short little chapters, so I might read a few. Chapter 1, The Birth of Jane in the City of New Philowashing York and how she grew up as a dog. There was once a cat. She was a small cat because she'd just been born. Her eyes were closed. Her mew was tiny and her tail pointy. Mew, mew, she mewed. Mew, mew. She was mewing because she was hungry. She was hungry because she was abandoned. She was abandoned because as soon as she was born, a garbage truck chased her mother away from underneath the dumpster. Cried the kitten. By and by, along came a dog. He heard her mewing. Mewed the kitten. The dog picked her up with his big, strong teeth and took her back to his dog wife. She'd just had a litter, and the dog husband was sure she wouldn't mind another mouth to feed. He placed the kitten in the middle of the squirming puppies. That's how this kitten grew up to be a cat who was a dog. She walked like a dog, she played like a dog, she talked like a dog, almost bow wow. She said, bow meow. She bar mewed. Jane was not just any dog in the litter, she was the top dog, the main man dog, the king of the castle dog. She held up her tail straight when she walked and brooked and brooked no nonsense. When they went for a walk, everyone had to walk behind her. Her brothers and sisters, her doggy daddy and her doggy mommy, and the human she kept as chief back scratcher and can opener. And Jane was a tough cookie, as tough as nails and as cool as cucumbers come. For instance, chapter two, the taming of Big Bad. In Jane's neighborhood was a bully dog. His name was Big Bad. He barked at cats, he barked at trucks, he barked at humans, he barked at dogs, but most of all, he chased cats. He loved chasing cats, big cats, small cats, old cats, young cats, ginger cats, black cats, gray cats, white cats, every which color cats. He didn't mind what kind of cat it was. He chased them all and loved it until he met Jane. It happened as Jane was taking her human for a walk. Jane was in the lead as usual. Then came her dog family on their leashes. Jane refused to wear a leash ever. Then came the human. They wandered down a street they'd never been on before. Suddenly, Big Bad shot out of the side gate of his owner's house and charged straight at her. He shouted fiercely. He said, and other things like that. Jane stopped and looked at him. She didn't flee. She didn't mew. She didn't stop waving her straight up in the air tail. Her human shouted, help! Her dog family strained their leashes trying to get behind the human. Oh, they were such cowards. Big Bag lunged at Jane. But did she flinch? Oh no. Jane flew straight into the air. She went like a rocket up like a rocket, hair bristling, eyes popping, teeth gnashing, and claws clawing as a horrible hissing, foaming, grunting, bow-meowing yodeled from her lungs. Down she came on Big Bad's head in a bundle of fury. She moved so fast, she made greased lightning look like a stroll in the park. Zip-zap, snicker-snap went her claws, fur went flying everywhere, and not a single hair was hers. Off she hopped from Big Bad's head, landed on the pavement, sat down daintily, daintily, and began to lick her paws and clean her face. That was the f last time Big Bad chased a cat. He was as good as gold when it came to cats. He whined and bowed low when he saw cats. Of course, this was nothing compared to the tiger that got loose on Broadway. But before we get to that, we have to tell the story of how Jane came to speak humanese. It happened like this. 
chapter 3, how Jane came to speak and read. Jane was sitting on her human's lap. She was having her mid-morning ear scratch and back smoothing. Suddenly, the phone rang. Ring, ring. Her human began to stand up and tilt Jane off her lap. Don't, said Jane clearly and distinctly. Her human sat down with a slight jar. The phone continued to ring. Ring, 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 ring. As you can tell, this was in the olden days before cell phones. Her human began to rise again, this time slowly and carefully. Don't, said Jane. Just leave it. That's how Jane came to speak humanese. The other thing which we must mention is that Jane could read. One day, a couple of weeks after her spe first speaking, her human was taking out the cans of cat food she'd brought specially for Jane. Jane stared at them. The cat said, catsy watsy fishy food for favorite felines. I'm not a cat, said Jane. Take them back. I beg your pardon, said, hum said her human. You heard me, said Jane, licking a paw. The cans were taken back, and the best high-quality dog food bought. That's how Jane came to read, and her human to know it. One more chapter. Jane's wandering and her prehensile tail. I think I'm saying that correctly. Prehensile tail. Jane wandered wherever she wished. Uptown, downtown, around town, about town. And it was on such a wander that she showed what her tail could do. She happened to be standing beside a bus, a bus stop when the bus came along. It was the 37C. It was the 37C, which runs to the center of town. The door opened, Jane hopped in, and off the bus drove. The driver grinned at her. I bet you don't have a ticket, he said. No, said Jane, smiling. The bus swerved, hit a curb, leaped into the air, and bounced back onto the road. The passengers screamed, an old lady fainted, and the driver got control of the bus again. Uh, sorry about that, the driver said to the passengers. I thought the cat talked to me. And he gave Jane a funny look. Jane didn't say another word. She leapt into the front dash and watched the world whiz by. Everybody off, cried the driver when they got downtown. This is as far as I go. Everyone got off and Jane was the last to leave. Bye, she called to the driver as the door closed. The door flew open and the driver rushed out, but Jane was nowhere in sight. Jane came to a tree, a large tree with spreading leafy branches. I think it was a chestnut. She climbed to a high branch and lazed and lounged and loafed. She gazed at all the life on the street. She watched the cars drive by, the ladies with funny hats, the men growing bald and dogs being led around on a leash. By and by, a girl with a double ponytail stopped below and peered up. Look, Mama, she said, grabbing her mother's hand, a stuck cat. A boy stopped to look too. She doesn't look stuck, he said, sucking a lollipop. Definitely looks stuck, said a shopkeeper coming out of his store. Here, kitty, kitty, called the boy, but Jane refused to look at cat callers. A crocodile of schoolgirls came snaking along. With them were three teachers, Professor Noall, the headmaster, and Professor Noall, the headmaster. They stopped, too. Here, kitty, 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 called the schoolgirls. Come down, kitty, kitty. The teachers wrung their hands. Poor thing, poor kittykins, they said. She must be frightened to death. What curious terminal markings, said Professor Noall, peering through his spectacles. I'll call the fire brigade, said the shopkeeper, going to his store. Wee-ow-wee-ow-honk, screamed the brazen fire truck rushing down the street. It stopped by three, by the tree, blocking traffic. Out ran four firemen carrying a ladder. Up the rungs climbed one. Here, kitty, 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 called the fireman holding out his hands. Jane climbed higher. Here, kitty, kitty, said the fireman climbing closer. Jane went out on a limb. Here, kitty, kitty, said the fireman climbing nearer. Jane walked to the end of the branch, very, very end, where the fireman couldn't get her. She wrapped her tail around the branch and fell over. Oh, gasped the teachers, clasping their hands to their chests. Oh, cried the schoolgirls, jumping back. Yikes, shouted the firemen, grabbing their trampoline and holding it underneath her. 
I've never seen a cat do that, exclaimed the shopkeeper. It's dangling by its tail. How, how, cried all the schoolgirls, mystified. Well, I'll be a Maine lobster, said Professor Knowall, stroking his goatee. This cat has a prehensile tail, how unusual. What, what, cried all the school teachers. A prehensile tail, repeated the Professor Knowall, such as many New World monkeys, possums, anteaters, binturongs, kinkajous, harvest mice, New World porcupines, and the tree pandolin have, and which can be used for grasping, climbing, seizing, and even hanging upside down, as we see here in this cat. Oh, said all the school teachers. Aha, cried the schoolgirls, holding one finger upright in the air. A prehensile tail, now we know. They waited and waited, but Jane didn't fall, nor did she come down. She dangled by her tail and swung back and forth in the breeze. After a while, she closed her eyes. Soon she began to snore. Everyone continued to wait, but Jane didn't come down till past midnight, and the street was deserted. That's how people found out that Jane had a prehensile tail. So this is one of many books that I love by an author called Reg Down. This is a wonderful author who's written many books, and I've read many of them. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I will continue it another time. Bye for now. See you Monday.